Hi, thanks for your nice introduction. Yes, my name is David Pieper, and today I'm going to talk about how we can analyze and visualize the structure of a Swift app. But before we get started, let me just highlight my... Notes. So let me introduce myself. Um, my name is David Pieper. I'm an iOS developer at Adesso Mobile Solutions here in Germany. And in my free time, I like to play around with new frameworks and explore new techniques and write about them in my blog. Also, I'm studying computer science, where I'm going to finish my master degree in about two to three months. And when I'm not programming, I like to play card and board games with friends. So let's dive into the topic. Swift projects, mainly iOS apps, were previously often quite small apps, which consisted only of a handful of features. Today, they are often large projects where multiple developers work on for many years, which consists of hundreds of source files, maybe thousands of code entities. So classes, structs, protocols, and so on. Um, but not only the project size grew, also the team size is increasing, introducing more complexity to the development process. Because each developer may have a little bit different style of coding, the architecture may differ between different parts of the app. Maybe we are using architectural patterns like Viper or MVVM to reduce the complexity, but it's also quite hard to see whether these patterns are implemented correctly throughout the whole app. So on the one hand, it's very hard and complex to analyze the structure and the architecture of an app. But on the other hand, it's also very important to do so to increase the quality and reduce the costs. There was a, publish, uh, um, yeah, a, pub a study published in 2005 by a group of developers which evaluated over 700 architectural reviews between 1988 and 2005. And they found that for projects of approximately 100,000 lines of code, they could save 1 million US dollar by finding bugs early in the development stage where they were quite easy to fix. But we are talking about full-blown architectural reviews here, which are very time and resource consuming. And it would be great if we could just automate the analysis and use an app to visualize the results. And that's what we are going to talk about today. So first, we will look at how we can analyze a Swift project, both the source code and the Xcode project. Next, we will look at how we can visualize the results of the analysis. And finally, we will add some features to make the visualization and the architecture more explorable. Let's get started with the analysis. So when we talk about dependencies, we talk about connections between code entities. And there are different types of dependencies. The first one is evolutional dependencies. Uh, in this case, for example, two classes were changed quite frequently in the same commits. So we can assume that they are working together. Another type are semantic similarities. In this case, two code entities share the same vocabulary. For example, they have similar documentation or similar comments. Then again, we can assume that they work together or implement the same kind of task. And a third type are structural dependencies. And that's the type we are going to focus on today because that are dependencies that we can extract by performing static code analysis. There are three different subtypes of structural dependencies. The first being inheritance. So for example, one class is a subclass of another class or some struct or class implements a protocol. Next, we have usage. For example, when a code entity is used as a parameter in a method or as a return type, or as a local variable. The third type is aggregation, meaning that, for example, a class has a property whose type is another code entity. And for the type usage, there are five additional subtypes. Um, local variable, method parameter, and method call uh, can be found in method declarations. And then we have also generic parameter and typecasting, for example, with as expressions. So how can we find the code entities and the dependencies between them in our Swift code? Well, let's look at a short example. Here we have a class called class A, which is a subclass of class B. It has a property and a method declaration. 
So first we can find a dependency of type inheritance from class A to class B. In the next line, we can find a dependency of type aggregation from class A to type int. Next, we have the method parameter, which introduces a dependency from class A to type string, or to be more precise, to type optional string. Then we can find a typecast, again, introducing a dependency from class A to string. In the next line, we have first a local variable, next generic parameters, and finally a method call. So now that we know what to look for, how can we extract these information from our source code? We have multiple options to do so, one of them being Swift Syntax. That's a framework provided by Apple to pass and inspect Swift source code. We start by getting the URL to a source file. We pass this URL to the so-called syntax tree parser, which will create a syntax tree representing the content of this source file. Next, we can use the syntax visitor that walks over the tree and inspects the nodes. But how does such a syntax visitor work? Well, it has multiple methods called wizard, which take a parameter called node. And this node has different types depending on which node is currently visited. For example, a class declaration syntax node or a protocol declaration syntax node. These methods return a so-called syntax visitor continue kind, defining whether the syntax visitor will also visit the children of the currently visited node or whether the children should be skipped. But the syntax visitor has more than just these two methods. It has multiple methods more and many more and even more. And actually, we just saw about a quarter of the available methods. There are over 230, each visiting a different type of node in our Swift code. So it can be quite hard to get started with Swift syntax because there are so many methods we could use and so many types of nodes that can be visited. A good starting point is to create a syntax visitor that visits every single node, prints out the name and the type. And by doing so and using this syntax visitor for various examples of Swift code, we can get a good feeling which nodes a Swift source file is made of. Another similar example is the website Swift AST Explorer, which is also linked at the Swift Syntax repository. And we can paste a snippet of Swift code and it would also show which nodes we can find inside a Swift source file. So when we use this visitor, on, for example, a class declaration, which we can see here, we have class A, that's a subclass of class B, and it also has a generic parameter. We can split up this declaration and look at which nodes this class declaration is made of. The first node that's visited is the so-called source file syntax node, representing the whole content of the source file. It has a child of type code block item list syntax. So in a Swift file, there may be multiple code blocks, for example, a class declaration, but also a protocol declaration, an extension, and maybe another extension. And each of these code blocks would be one child of the code block item list node. In this case, we only have one class declaration being the only code block item syntax. This has the class declaration syntax nodes as its only child. And here is where it gets interesting. First, we can find the class keyword. Next, we can find the identifier being the name of the class that's currently declared. The third child of the class declaration syntax is a so-called generic parameter clause syntax containing the information about generic parameter. It has a child of type generic parameter list syntax, which again holds one child for each generic parameter. In this case, only one being T. Then we can also find the left angle bracket and the right angle bracket. The fourth section is the type inheritance clause syntax, defining which classes are superclasses of the currently declared class and which protocols are implemented. It starts with the colon and then has the implemented types. In this case, only class B, which is the so-called simple type identifier. 
Finally, we have the so-called member declaration block syntax, which holds the rest of the class declaration. So this simple class declaration node is made of multiple different nodes. And to extract the code entities and dependencies between them, only these information are relevant. We need to know that the currently declared class is called class A, and it has a dependency to an entity called class B of type inheritance. And by visiting different types of code snippets, we can extract all the information we need. For example, we could handle protocol declarations or struct declarations in a quite similar way. And we could also inspect more difficult examples like um, a recursive enum declaration, which has raw values or a method declaration. But we need more information than just what we can extract from the source code. We also need to look at the Xcode project file. In such an Xcode project file, we can find a so-called PBX native target section, which in this example is called app. It has a list of build phases, in this case, only one being the source build phase, defining which files are compiled when this target is built. We can also find the PBX sources build phase, where we can find the previously declared sources build phase. This build phase has a list of files that are the files that are compiled. These files can be found in the PBX build file section where we can find a file ref to the actual file. In this case, there's only one file in the sources build phase called file.svet. Given the file ref for, the, for this file, we can look in the PBX group section to see what group the file is part of. In this case, it's contained in the child group, which itself is part of the main group. And by following this pattern, we can start in the um, target section, look at the source build section, finally find the files that we need to look at, and can extract the information which groups they are contained in. This can be done with the framework Xcode Proj, which allows us to easily pass and inspect an Xcode project file. We can create a so-called Xcode Proj object given the file path to the Xcode project file. And then we can um, access the targets with a given name, extract the source build phases, and finally get the files. Then we can map over these files and get to the groups they are contained in. So now we know which code entities are part of the Xcode project. We know which dependencies exist between these code entities, and we know how they are structured in groups and maybe modules. So let's take a step further and look at how we can visualize these results. We have multiple requirements to show the visualization. The first, we want to create a so-called node link diagram where the nodes represent the code entities and the links represent dependencies between them. Next, we want to use container nodes like groups and source files to encapsulate the code entities. Because when we show all entities at once, it, get, it gets quite crowded because as I said in the beginning, there may be thousands of entities in one project. There is this project called Objective-C and Swift Dependency Visualizer, which shows all entities at once. And here I analyzed a quite small project, but it's already very crowded and hard to get the information we are looking for. So we want to use these container nodes to get a better overview. Next, we don't want to place our entities randomly. We want to let the dependencies define the position of the nodes in such a way that all the dependencies point down to the bottom, if possible. Of course, we may have cyclic dependencies, then that's not always the case. Um, that's because when we look at these two graphs, we can see that the right one is uh, far easier to understand than the left one, although they consist of the same nodes and edges. In this case, of course, it's quite simple. We could understand the left one 
um, as well. But imagine there are maybe 10, 15 or 20 groups in one group. And so we have, when we open this group, 20 different nodes. And when they are placed randomly, it's quite hard to get the structure. Okay, how can we do this? Well, we would want to look at this short example. We have one group called UI that consists of one source file viewcontroller.swift. Inside of this viewcontroller.swift, we can find three different code entities. The first called viewcontroller. It has a dependency to a search protocol to implement some tasks. So there is a dependency of type usage or aggregation. And then we have the service implementation implementing the service protocol. So there is a dependency from service implementation to service protocol of type inheritance. Of course, there may be multiple groups inside of one group or the group UI may be itself part of another group. But in a short example, UI is the topmost uh, node, the topmost group, and it only holds this one source file. So we start by creating container nodes for the group and the source file. And then we want to arrange them in a way that um, we have a, a hierarchical layering. So the topmost node is the UI group node. When we open it, for example, by double clicking it, we want to see the nodes it contains, in this case being the viewcontroller.swift node. When we open this node, we want to see the code entities. So each node needs to know which nodes to show when it's opened and which nodes to hide when it's closed. So the UI node needs to know that the viewcontroller.swift node is the node of the next hierarchical layer. And the viewcontroller.swift node needs to know that viewcontroller service protocol and service implementation need to be shown when it's opened. So once we have this structure, we can continue by calculating the position of the nodes in one hierarchical layer. We want to place them in a way that the dependencies all point down. To do so, we want to place service implementation and view controller in the topmost level and the service protocol in a lower level in this example. We can do so by assigning X and Y coordinates to each node. For example, by um, creating a lexicographical sorting in one layer so that the service implementation has a lower X coordinate than the view controller node. Of course, there are more sophisticated methods, for example, the Sugiyama algorithm, which minimizes the angle between nodes over multiple layers. But this is far more complicated, takes more time. And with a lexicographical sorting, it's more easy to find a node in a layer that we are looking for. Y coordinate is the length of the longest path to a source node. A source node is a node that has no incoming connections. So in this example, service implementation and view controller. We start by placing these nodes in the topmost layer. Then we place all other nodes below. In this example, we have service protocol, which has two incoming connections, both starting in source nodes. So both paths have a long length of one. And so service protocol is placed in layer one. And by following these rules, we can place as many nodes as we need to. Okay, so now that we have calculated the hierarchical structure and the positioning, let's look at how a visualization could look like. First, we have a node UI, the topmost group node. When we open it, for example, by double clicking, it shows its inner nodes being the view controller, the Swift node, which can be opened again to show the code entities. So we wanted to have a node link diagram and we wanted to use container nodes to create a hierarchical structure. Finally, we also calculated a good positioning so that the dependencies all give a, stru a clear structure. Okay, great. Now that we have finished our visualization, let's look at some more features we can add to make the architecture more explorable. And to do so, let's look at a short demo. So here we have a project I created called Swiftalyzer. It's made of three panels. 
The left one is called navigation panel. In the middle, we have the so-called canvas panel where we can find the hierarchical dependency graph. We have the node UI, which, ah, one second, so, which can be moved around. We can open it so that it shows its inner node, and then we can open that again to see the codes entities. We can move these nodes around as well and close and open again. On the right side, we can see the information panel, which shows additional information about the project. For example, if we select a container node, like a group or a source file, we can see how many groups, entities, and source files are contained in this container node. When we select a code entity node, we can see some metrics, for example, the number of incoming and outgoing edges. In this case, view controller has zero incoming edges and one outgoing edges. Also, we can see the cumulative component dependency metric together with depends on and average component dependency, which give good information about the dependency structure of the project. For example, if we would have multiple um, cyclic dependencies or large cycles, these values would increase quite a lot. But in this case, they are quite low because we have no cycles. On the left, the navigation panel consists of th three different tabs. The first is the project tab that shows the groups, the source files, and the entities. And we can see that the selection is synced between all three panels. Next to the project tab, we have the tags tab, which allow us to create categories of nodes. For example, we have the tag classes holding the service implementation and the view controller. We can hide these nodes and show them again. That's quite useful if we want to inspect one part of the app in detail, then we can hide all other parts. But we don't need to use the exact names. For example, we can also use regular expressions like in the service tag, which holds all nodes which have service in the name. And by hiding them, we only see the view controller. So for example, if we want to focus on the business logic or services, then we can hide all other nodes that don't contain the name service, for example. Finally, we have a history tag. Every time we move a node, we close a node, or we open a node, or tags are changed, one item in the history is recorded. And then we can just go back and forth again. That's very useful if we want to inspect one part in detail. Maybe we hide all other nodes and we open all nodes until we find the part we want to inspect then we can just step out again once we are finished by going back. Okay. Um, yeah, so to wrap it all up, first we looked at how we can analyze a Swift project by using Swift syntax to explore the source files and by using the framework Xcode approach to get information about the Xcode project structure. Next, we looked at how we can visualize the dependencies and we looked at how to create a hierarchical layering and how to calculate the positions. Finally, we looked at additional features, for example, um, tags, a history, and metrics to make the structure of a project more explorable. Thank you very much. If you have questions now, you can ask me right now or in the extended Q&A. And you can find me on Twitter and ask me questions there. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something.